today's uh, rise of populism is not the real problem, actually it's uh, a mere symptom and the problem is indeed the rise of uh, inequalities uh, within the countries. There are a lot of people who have been disenfranchised by globalization and remove all certain trade barriers and these are the people who populist politicians are targeting. I think that the emerging countries deserve a much higher position, a much more important position at the table as well, because the West is clearly not as important player moving forward. Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much, Priscilla, for introducing uh, me to the audience. Um, it's a great pleasure for me to be here together with my panelists. I, I do not really know why it is me that you have chosen to moderate this session. As the others will notice, I'm not a particularly moderate person, so I can't promise to be a good moderator in that respect. Um, topic is uh, the global economic outlook. Um, a global economic outlook where, in my perception, uh, as an entrepreneur and economist, we at the moment share uh, a large consensus as to the economy is doing reasonably well. Uh, the international institutions that produce forecasts for next year and this year, they have all raised up their forecasts by just a notch. It's not going to be particularly fantastic, the outlook, but it's not particularly bad. And at the same time, I sense from talking to you at the symposium, to my clients, and also to the panelists to some extent, um, that we're skeptical. We're skeptical because we've seen these disruptions that we've talked about for the last two days. Today we talked about <coughs> Trump and Brexit, and there are those who say, well, Trump is great for the world economy, um, and those that say Trump is the end of it. <coughs> um, we are skeptical because we see these disruptions on the technology side. I mean, we've, we've heard both po this p positions so far. Uh, as an enabler of growth and as, uh, uh, as a tool of destroying employment, uh, at least. And maybe I might add, we might even be skeptical because we do not trust the data anymore that we are using. What are we measuring when we measure GDP, national income, the statistics that we usually forecast when we talk about the economic cycle. I'm, I'm glad I don't have to make sense of that today and I'm joined by a fantastic group of people here on the panel um, and who I will introduce to you in a moment. But before I do that, um, we have a little question for you as in every <coughs> other session so far. And if we might want to pull it up, it's a simple question. Um, how will the global economic situation develop over the next year? So let's check on what you think, whether you believe this consensus or whether you actually are more skeptical as I have described. So while you take in the answer, um, uh, I will ask that question again uh, at the later stage in the, in the panel and see whether we've any, we will see any changes. And maybe you can capture this on the screen. I have a hypothesis as to what the difference between the two votes actually will be, and I will not change it. I will put it here and I will read it, we'll read it to you. And then let's see whether that little experiment actually works. Can we have a look at it? So 52% believe it's going to improve, 24% the same. Oh, so it's, we are an optimistic crowd. What else could we be as leaders of tomorrow and leaders of yesterday? I think that's all. <laughs> um, let me start by introducing the panel and we'll, go, we will, we'll start with David Blitzer. Um, and I will just do it quickly because you can read it all up. And, David is, uh, is somebody I'm very envious of because he has a fantastic track record in forecasting short-term economic <laughs> development. I mean, you, you've got a prize by a very prestigious organization for being the most accurate forecaster in the US. I'm also jealous of a book that you've written. I've seen this. What's the econ economy trying to tell you? And I, I will ask you in a moment what they're, what they're trying to tell us. We're looking forward to that. David is the chairman of the Index Committee of Standard & Poor's. So they, they create these benchmarks that financial investors have to invest against. And in a sense, he's the most senior person on the panel. And that's not because of the color of the hair or anything else. It's because he decides on whether the other gentleman will have a good bonus or not, because inclusion in, an, in a stock market index really makes a difference. So when I come to Christoph Franz, who sits right next to me, who is, uh, by the way, also an economist. We're all economists. We, he's a, disguised himself very well. Um, chairman of uh, Roche, um, 
I don't need to introduce that company, I, I think, with a very distinctive career in the airline business. Uh, he was the CEO of Lufthansa and for us here in Switzerland, very important. Before that, he was the one who managed the turnaround of our previously national, now German, um, Swiss international airline. Thank you for joining us. Then I have Mario Greco with me, the CEO. It's, it's really strange. I mean, David is kind of the boss of Christoph. Christoph is for sure the boss of Mario because he sits on the board of Zurich Insurance Company and Mario Greco is group executive uh, officer there. He has a very distinguished career in, in the insurance business, but he's also a very good economist. And when you look at this, and, and maybe some of the strategy might reflect that, and I will test you on that in a moment. And finally, we have Leslie Marstop with us, also an economist, but also in disguise. Leslie is the chief financial officer of the New Development Bank, which is kind of the aspiration of the BRICS country, and yes, it's important because that stands for South Africa, where Leslie comes from, to rival um, other development banks uh, in the world. Uh, the first African person to be named advisor to um, the international advisor to Goldman Sachs, so also a very distinguished career in banking. So with all that, can we start? Um, let's do this quickly. The first round I want to ask to my panelists uh, a simple question. Do you believe in this consensus? So global growth looks great. Um, um, the US economy had a very bad first quarter, but everybody expects that to do better. And David, if I may ask you in particular about the US economy, I mean, what is your take on that? What is your expectation for the next 18 months or so? Uh, <coughs> I would discount the first quarter in the U.S. economy. For the last three or four years, the first quarter has been uh, not very good, and it may be in the numbers a little bit, uh, and so on. Plus, if you dig into it, uh, consumer spending was picking up, and the biggest difference was in the fourth quarter of last year, everybody accumulated inventories, and the first quarter they sold them all off, which sort of explains a big chunk of the down. It ought to be about one and a half, not 0.7. The rest of this year and into next year, I think we'll see 2 to 2.5% growth. The U.S. is probably going to be near the top of the list and not the top of the list among developed countries around the world and uh, you know, sort of leading the way. Inflation in the U.S. is ticking up slightly, and uh, sometime this summer in, in the fall, we will hit the Fed's 2% target, which they've been waiting since about 2008 to get up to that high. Uh, and they'll probably respond by raising interest rates a little bit again, um, maybe as soon as June, but certainly at least once, if not twice, by the end of the year. We're also doing a, a bit of a transition. For the last just about 10 years, really since the beginning of the financial crisis, uh, this has been a game of economics and economic policy and really technical economics. For economists, it's been absolutely fascinating for everybody including the economy, it's probably been very frustrating at the beginning. But we are making a shift, and with the, last, with the election last year, this is now political economy, and the emphasis is definitely on political and not economy. So Trump makes a difference? Pardon? Trump makes a difference? Um, Trump will make a difference down the road. Every president of the U.S. gets all the credit, all the blame for when he's in office. Uh, what happened in the first quarter, for good or bad, had nothing to do with Trump. As we roll through the year and we see what he does and doesn't do, uh, he'll bear some of the responsibility one way or another. There is a tendency of the U.S. economy at midterm, so after two years uh, in the middle of the presidential electoral cycle, um, to be a little bit softish. And after how many years? Eight years of expansion? Could that be the end of it, of this expansion of the U.S. economy? Uh, it could be. Economic expansions don't end because of old age. They end because somebody does something. Um, the traditional description used to be, you took the American economy, turned it upside down when it was in recession, and looked at the bottom, it would be inscribed, brought to you by the Federal Reserve. Uh, maybe this time it will be described, brought to you by a collapse of our foreign trade. We'll see. Thank you. Christoph, Europe, uh, we've talked a lot about Europe. Um, is it in such bad shape that we need to worry? I mean, m maybe a little anecdote. We, we had this, uh, we had a reporter calling into our office, uh, very well known, so I won't give away the name, and uh, Swiss 
economic journalist, and, and he asked us, you know, latest Eurozone growth numbers that were better than the American, no surprise here. Um, I said, and at the end of it, um, he, he just, the last question he asked was, so the Eurozone is growing? And by the way, it's now four years in a row that the Eurozone has been grown. And the last sentence he said was, why didn't anybody tell us about it? <laughs> so do you share that skepticism or is it, are you more on the optimistic side? I wouldn't call this skepticism. I uh, just, you know, sharing facts. And uh, it is true that uh, Europe hasn't done that bad the, these last years. But uh, it came uh, on, uh, on the back of uh, this quantitative easing policy of the European Central Bank. Uh, zero percent uh, interest rate in Europe. And this is not only uh, now in the markets for one year, but year after year after years. And uh, when you ask uh, life insurance companies, when you ask uh, the pension uh, schemes, uh, um, uh, this is uh, a growing burden for the economy. And uh, though I'm quite confident with regards to the development of the economy in Europe, um, I think uh, the big challenge will be to withdraw this uh, drug of low interest rate uh, without uh, the consequence of uh, then a collapsing European economy. And uh, uh, what, what I most, most regret is the fact that though we have seen some growth in Europe, um, the uh, fundamental idea of this uh, uh, very low interest policy was uh, to buy time for European national governments in the Eurozone to implement necessary structural reforms. And uh, I don't feel that this time has been adequately but used it, it by the government. It has never happened anyhow. I mean, I'm, I'm in this trade for 20, 21 years now, and I can't remember a single year where we didn't say that whatever government had to introduce structural reforms to improve things. Is that unrealistic to expect um, anything? <laughs> I would not share this perspective because we have seen substantial reforms in some countries, but in other countries, uh, so what nothing, countries are you worried happened. about? Uh, look at a, a country like like Greece. Yeah, still too much debt, etc. Still a long way to go. But when you look at uh, uh, the the structural reforms they have implemented, this is very substantial. Same is true for for Spain and also for Portugal, for Ireland. Um, to a lesser degree, but to some degree also in Italy. Uh, the, the strong countries in the Eurozone, like Germany, didn't do anything. Uh, the, even they, they handed out further uh, social benefits and uh, benefited from the low interest rate uh, for their own interest bill. Yeah. So short-term optimism and medium-term, you're a little bit skeptical. Mario, I, I alluded to your um, economics career, I should say, or your, your strong interest in, in, in economics. And, when one looks at the strategy of, uh, of, of Zurich, uh, I, I do sense there is a focus towards emerging markets, but not indiscriminately. You're, you're really looking at some of them, and, and I want Leslie to talk about Asia. Um, I, I hope you don't mind asking you about the other ones, in particular Latin America, because you have singled out that as a very interesting spot. What's your take on the Latin American cyclical situation at the moment? Yeah, uh, Latin America is uh, fundamentally driven by Brazil and then Mexico. Uh, Brazil and Mexico are doing better than we forecasted a year ago, the, better than we feared. Uh, of course, Mexico is every day hit by the Twitters of uh, the American president, but uh, it's, still, it's still doing fine despite that. Um, uh, it, the, the other country which is quite interesting, and we don't often consider that, is Colombia. Colombia has uh, um, reached uh, an important uh, peace agreement after many, many years. They have the biggest uh, infrastructure program that uh, at least we know in the world. Um, it's, um, it's a very interesting government, um, full of competences and full of goodwill. Um, the country is uh, rather small today in terms of traction on Latin America, but it's evolving very well. So, you know, contrary to the expectation a year ago, contrary to the forecast, Brazil and Mexico are holding up, uh, Colombia is growing, I think Latin America is uh, heading to a good year with a lot of political risks because we're going to have election in Brazil, 
uh, in Mexico is fragile, and, uh, and uh, you know the, the newly reached the peace agreement in Colombia is just a few weeks old and might not, might not last too long. Yeah, but is that in this political risk argument, if you look at a group of countries, you, don't you always come up with that? I mean, it's a bit like in Europe. Europe has, what, I mean, 27 soon to be members of yeah. the European Union. You have, the, all of them are democracies. Most of them have coalition governments. They have three national television stations, 20 newspapers, every country. There's bound to be noise. Correct. And, and this is the time we live, where economy is getting better and the political risks are getting much higher, much worse than before. Um, I think the economy, uh, if let alone, will continue improving, but we don't know how to manage and how to forecast the political risks. And something is going to happen because we have too many elections, too many uncertainties, and too many social distress uh, cases uh, across uh, Europe and across the world. And so something is going to happen. Uh, we don't know exactly what and where, but uh, it's a political issue much more than an economical one. Leslie, I mean, you're my last pillar of hope. I mean, these guys were so well balanced and yes, things are getting better, there's some risk and, you know, medium term. Can you give us some real bad news or...? <laughs> <laughs> Let me start off by saying that uh, I've lived in China for two years now, um, uh, working for the BRICS uh, New Development uh, Bank. And firstly, one of the real benefits that Chinese policymakers have is that they can take a much longer term uh, perspective. Uh, and for, for, let me not uh, in any way leave you with the impression that I'm promoting a one-party state, but there's huge value in having the uh, comfort that you will be in charge for the next 10, 15, 20, 30 years. For that reason, you can have very long-term economic trajectories in, in a place like uh, China. One of the challenges with the markets and with the economy and the way that we analyze economic forecasts, outlooks, history in a more Western Anglo-Saxon sense is that we are so short-term focused. We are focused on quarterly profits. We are focused on quarterly results. Uh, you know, the advent of social media has even worsened that where we, we look at short-term uh, indicators. In China, there's a much more of a long-term perspective that defines the uh, paradigm. I'll give you one example there is a very ambitious regional economic uh, strategy that the Chinese have uh, embarked on in about 2013 called the One Belt, One Road, which uh, President Xi Jinping is, is the main uh, proponent of. And this involves 65 countries uh, across three different uh, continents, and the aim is to connect China uh, uh, with uh, Central Asia, the uh, rest of, of Europe, Africa, uh, etc. And it's an elaborate strategy to connect infrastructure, whether it's through ports, rail, high-speed rail, uh, energy projects, connecting the, the various parts of the, uh, of the world. So infrastructure will continue to be a major driver of uh, growth. But I guess the point that I want to underscore is that we cannot continue to have this major reliance on China because there are also some very troubling signs. And I want to leave you with this uh, thought. I think we are sitting here in 2017 with uh, there's a veneer of stability from all the comments that my colleagues have made, but the world is still very much recovering from the big structural uh, undercurrents that produced the 2008 financial uh, crisis. There's still excessive borrowing. Uh, there's still, uh, you know, excessive financialization in the economy, building up of, of um, uh, entitlements in terms of, of health care, pension benefits, uh, and, and so on. I'll leave you with one statistic that makes me a little bit nervous about China. The total debt to GDP uh, in China in 2007, just before the financial uh, crisis, was $7 trillion. Okay. Today, it's just over $28 trillion. So there's been a fourfold increase over the space of the last uh, eight years. And a lot of that comes from local governments, state-owned enterprises, etc. So you have a build-up of what one can only classify as unsustainable debt. So that growth story, one should uh, temper with these very problematic sort of under underpinnings. It's fascinating. There has been no deleveraging whatsoever in the world economy, and China is the world champion in spending money with not, without creating much growth. And this is something I worry. You live in China, we should reveal that to the audience. You live in Shanghai, and the Chinese government has uh, spent a lot of money to keep the growth rate at 6.5, which everybody roughly believes is trend growth at the moment. 
how long can this go on? I mean, the, the efficiency is like you have to imagine. The, the efficiency is they spend 24 five points of GDP by increasing debt, and they get one percent point percentage point more growth out of it. Look, I mean, as I mentioned, the, the uh, Chinese economy is very unique in the sense it's much more of a planned uh, uh, economy, right? So we'll give you a, a quick little snapshot of the Chinese uh, landscape. I mean, about 65% actually of Chinese GDP comes actually from the eastern coastline and, and the south. That large part of China in the center and towards the, uh, towards the west is very underdeveloped and actually quite poor. Uh, does not have modern airport infrastructure, modern roads, high-speed rail, e e etc. So there's still a significant growth story. So there is still strong growth underpinnings that could still propel China for the next 20, uh, 20 years or so because of that uh, infrastructure gap that still uh, exists. So there are still you know, inherent factors within the Chinese economy that can propel it uh, forward. So I guess the, the impression I'm leaving uh, uh, with you is, is a more mixed story. There's signs of optimism because of the, the long-term trajectory and the long-term nature that economic policymakers do not have to worry whether they'll be in power, like in France or Germany or the US. Will Trump be elected in four years was a big question uh, this morning. Xi Jinping will be around for the next uh, six years. He will be re-elected in October so they can plan. Uh, there's a great luxury to that. I mean, uh, Christoph, uh, Mario, you both have very significant businesses directly or indirectly uh, in China. Would you want to chip in on this? What do you see in China when you look at... Yeah, can I, can, I, can I also add India too? Sure. Because we, we did yeah. not mention it. And India is uh, equally uh, fast growing and moving. Um, right. They still have a relevant issue in establishing the institutions and the structure to allow the economy to grow. And uh, they're less directive than, than China. You know, they are a democracy. So they're struggling more than China in speeding this up. But still, I mean, the, the potential is immense. Uh, the results have been impressive. The government is really changing um, uh, uh, literally by days uh, the structure of the uh, Indian economy. Um, it's a very, very interesting opportunity in the next years. On China, you know, it's the biggest internet market in the world already today. It is the biggest, uh, uh, the second biggest insurance uh, uh, market in the world already today. So it is underdeveloped, but it's already the biggest economy, the biggest uh, uh, internet market, the second biggest market uh, for our industry. Um, you know, I, I, I think, I think we should. Uh, we should stop considering that as a development case, and now we should start considering them as the reference. Okay, that's for the structural reason. But when you look at it now, I mean, this, the next 18 months, that's our brief. They, 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 they have the beauty that they can plan. No one else can do that. No one else is uh, without the pressure of elections, of uh, consensus. Uh, they can plan, and they're acting for the next 10 years, and they know exactly how to balance. Maybe I have to step in here to save your reputation. I, 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 I believe you are a true believer in market economy and liberal economics, and um, it's fascinating. Many of the business leaders, and I, I will hear from you in a moment, the leaders of tomorrow, many of the business leaders today seem to be full of admiration of planned economic systems, and they seem to have a lot of trust in it. Is that, do you share that, Christoph? Um, actually, I'm, 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 I'm a big supporter of market economy, but uh, acting... A but. There was a but. Yeah. There yes. is a but, yeah. because uh, the pharmaceutical industry is probably one of the most regulated industries worldwide. So I have to live with state intervention up to an extremely detailed level. But, but you don't really sign up to it. I mean, you would rather get rid of it, would you? <laughs> it depends uh, on what you're talking. Obviously, when it comes, for example, to approval of medicines, I think every patient is very glad to have high standards of approval. When it comes to pricing regulation, um, we would uh, favor more liberal pricing systems than we, we have today, and there are only few countries who still believe that also the healthcare system is a system where uh, efficiency can be created by competition instead of the wise decision of a state institution. So when you look at China, does it worry you the, the, the degree to which the Chinese government is still involved in managing the economy on a short-term basis, actually? Um, at least in the last years, they have uh, shown uh, that um, 
they were able to steer without derailing uh, the economy, which I think is a, is a, is a very substantial achievement. With regard uh, to uh, the next years to come, it is obvious that there is an interest to shift uh, economic growth inside China more to consumption. And uh, this will clearly uh, benefit also an industry like, like ours. We will see more investment, uh, for example, in, in health in China, and uh, not only in the big cities, but uh, also uh, coming to, to the countryside. So in, in our case, I feel this is a positive development. Um, but uh, being a non-Chinese uh, player in the market, you are always uh, exposed uh, Okay, uh, so this means he can't say what he really thinks. David, I mean, <laughs> were you exposed to the... But David, you were shaking your head in disbelief. I, I would take a, a somewhat different view of China. Um, they are very controlled, they are very planned, um, but I, I have some doubts. They, they managed to avoid a recession, that was very good, but they bought their way out with all that debt. And I don't know the debt to GDP ratio off the top of my head, but it's not very... 282% GDP. Yeah, it's, it's not very attractive by any means. Um, it's about the same as the rest of uh, the other developed world. Though, so. Of the developed world, but developed. not of the developing world. That's actually world um, record almost. And I guess the other thing that always makes me wonder about China and, and so on, they had something called the one-child policy for a while, and their age description a distribution and their question of an aging society in many ways is as difficult and as big a problem as it is in various countries in Europe um, and so on. And going forward to keep growing, they have the same problem we all do, which is productivity. Because if we're going to keep getting richer and we don't grow the population, don't grow the labor force fast enough, we got to all be more productive. And Lately, that's been very difficult for everybody, including China. So I, I don't think they're the panacea to the world. And I guess if I had to bet um, between China and India, I think I'd bet on India this week it, or this year. This week. It's a lot messier, <laughs> and it's a lot more confused. And we do indices in both with local organizations in both. Um, but out of all that turmoil, Sometimes comes a market that works instead of a plan that doesn't quite work all the time. So gentlemen, this has um, all been skeptic. very well behaved. I'm getting increasingly frustrated. Let's talk about disruptions. I mean, this is, <laughs> this is too good to be true, right? I mean, they're telling us growth is going to be great. It's, uh, inflation is not really an issue. It dares a little. I, this is how I at least understood you, David. Um, central right might, you know, might do a little bit, but not very much. This is the I mean, dream world for every investment banker. I, I worked at a large bank and I, had, I have a déjà vu, it sounds like 2006, nobody would believe that anything could happen because everything was just great and was just getting better. Looking at disruptions, uh, force yourself, please, uh, Leslie. Where would <laughs> Come, let's say in the world of, of uh, finance, uh, I think it's important to highlight one or two um, what I would call significant uh, developments in China. China is now the single biggest issuer in uh, green bonds or in the green finance market. And this is very, very important. As we know, there has been considerable environmental degradation as a result of you know, quite uh, uh, significant growth over several uh, decades and not sufficient accommodation of the environmental uh, factor and the depletion of natural resources. But China has a very clear plan. Over the next five years, they've quantified it. They need, to, uh, they need to be spending in the order of $1.5 um, trillion uh, over the next five years alone as part of the transition towards a green uh, economy. So in terms of disruption, China is literally putting in place the necessary incentives, the regulatory framework to ensure that we move away from what has been a very traditional uh, approach in, in modern uh, finance. So um, this year, uh, last year, for example, the New Development Bank issued its first bond. We just established two years ago as an institution. We issued our first uh, bond of $3 billion. Uh, there is a suggestion that this market will grow into a $50 billion market in China alone. That is the current size of the total uh, bond issuances in the green finance market in the entire world. So China's taken on a leadership role in the transition to the green economy at the time when, as we heard this morning, uh, Mr. Trump and some of his officials believe that climate change is a hoax. 
Uh, so, so it's very important to see some of these, what I would call disruptive um, uh, initiatives in uh, finance, because it's literally about remodeling, reconfiguring the entire industry and how, it, and how it works. So this issue of greening up the financial system is a significant innovation that is causing uh, disruption. And will that, I mean, positive or negative? I mean, it's hugely positive, because think about it. I, mean, I live in Shanghai, it's not as bad as Beijing. But, Beijing but basically you're saying we're going to have more debt. Uh, well, when I say uh, green finance, obviously uh, this is about issuing, uh, uh, this is about bonds. Uh, institutions from all over the world will be able to access that market at the moment. The Chinese bond market is very much domestic, right? So it's uh, 70, 80 uh, trillion renminbi, so it's about uh, eight, nine uh, trillion uh, dollars of, of, uh, um, uh, in terms of the size of the, of, of the bond market, and most of that is domestic, right? What will happen now, they've, they've just announced uh, opening up of regulations, so foreign, foreigners will be able to access that uh, market. But I believe it will be more sustainable because there's much more, we're talking here about the long-term debt markets. This is not short-term paper of one or two or three years. You're talking about five, ten, and in some cases... Oh, like subprime, that was also... <laughs> that is very, very... Mortgage uh, finance uh, was also a very safe uh, business, I remember. I'm referring to, to, to very traditional bonds, but it has a green stamp uh, on it. It's not quite structured products of the kind that, that we had with subprime products. Mario, an insurer should be paranoid of disruptions. Help us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, insurance is uh, probably at the forefront of disruption today because it's an industry that hasn't changed for centuries. Disruption is brought in by technology, and technology is used by consumers, by all of you, and this is changing, reshaping completely the industry. Now, I wouldn't uh, agree that uh, you have to be paranoid. I think it's a great opportunity to uh, find uh, a different uh, a way of working into the insurance and different relationship with the customers. Insurance has seen customer retention, customer loyalty falling down every year um, since uh, the 90s to today. And this is an opportunity to re-establish a, a decent proposition with the customers and regain customers' trust. Wonderful. The, you, your board members seem to have been a little bit worried about rising, rising interest rates. Um, uh, and that was in the context of European debt. But when I look at insurers, uh, when I talk to insurance companies, uh, CEOs and board members, they typically complain that interest rates are so low. So We complain always. Always. But, you yeah. know... But in particular on the level of interest rates, right? And, um, and they all say, oh, we, we would do much better if interest rates were one, two, three percentage points higher. Correct. Um, yeah, that is correct. I believe that. But how do you get there with, uh, with, uh, without um, burning all your equity? Because you have investments and they, there is an interest rate sensitivity to that. And there's probably a mismatch in your balance sheet and duration. But not really. I mean, the balance sheets, uh, at least as I'm speaking for my company, but... I well, let's not talk about your company, right. because but you couldn't uh, the tell market, us anything. Uh, the market is pretty well balanced today on duration. Uh, what uh, higher interest rates allow you is to open up to a number of new products, uh, many more that you can sell today, and reopen a business like life, uh, which has been really shut to minimum, because of the negative rates. So it is true. I mean, we're better off with uh, um, you know, rates in the positive range. Then but it all depends you know, where, where these rates will go. But, uh, and how fast. Yeah. But, but we were complaining about too much debt in the world earlier in our discussion. Yeah. Now, who holds all these nominal assets? Where are they? Aren't they also in the insurance system? They are, of course. So if you want to get rid of debt, at, you know, that is what everybody, I think, would subscribe to immediately, doesn't, mean it, doesn't that mean at the same time, because somebody else's debt is somebody else's asset, that we will have to get rid of a lot of assets? And it's so difficult to imagine that that would not hurt you. Yeah, but the, the complication of the story, and I, I don't know how uh, you know, known this is to all of you, is that uh, when the crisis started, the European regulators changed the capital rules of insurance company and forced, forced uh, a quote-unquote, but in reality, they really forced us to hold sovereign exposure, sovereign debt. So where we are today is that all of us uh, uh, fundamentally own big chunks of sovereign, uh, depending by countries, but uh, we all, um, uh, the uh, biggest percentage of our assets are 
European sovereign exposure as European companies, and we all own very little equities and very little real investments, which, by the way, was, was a silly choice because it depressed further the European economies at the time at which the, Europe, the European economies needed investors to throw money into real investments. But that was done, and this is the situation today. So there is an issue, probably. I mean, when you look at the world, I mean, uh, disruptions that worry you? Oh, that was an so. answer already, almost. <laughs> <laughs> then I can be short. <laughs> yeah, please. <laughs> No, uh, we, uh, we will not be uh, disrupted to the same uh, extent as other industries which are more exposed to the economic uh, cycle or to short-term economic disruptions because in the end of the day the demand uh, is uh, driven, yes, by public uh, health budgets, but uh, even public health budgets uh, tend to be fairly stable. And the second element is the... Um, quantity of new and innovative medicines coming to the market. So it's uh, innovation driven and it's uh, driven by public budgets. Both are not closely linked to the economic cycle. So that gives us a little bit more room for the maneuver short term. And uh, I'm, I'm quite confident that uh, our business, also driven by the demographics uh, you mentioned, uh, we'll, we'll see a, a positive uh, uh, development and we'll hopefully be able to contribute to a, uh, a longer, healthy life also in the future. Yeah. This is amazing, David. I mean, we, we as pra practitioners and economists, we are confronted with a bunch of people who are, don't see any risks. Or they see risk, but they're out there. They are. Yeah, but sure, <laughs> come later. <laughs> yeah, but sure, there are risks. We have seen yesterday uh, uh, the uh, vote on the repeal of, of Obamacare, and uh, okay, let's now assume that this is really in the end via the Senate uh, becoming uh, new legislation in the U.S. Uh, it will definitely influence uh, the structure and the financing of the U.S. healthcare system, but. Um, for, for a company based on, on innovation-based medicines, the, the, the core question is, um, will the U.S. also in the future continue to reward innovation? And will the U.S. also continue to bring new innovative medicines fast to patients? And I believe this is independent of any U.S. government not going to change. And that gives me a confidence that the business model also in the future will be a viable business model clearly being exposed to changes in the financing, we also see cost pressure in Europe and all that stuff. Um, but uh, I'm confident if we are innovative enough, we will overcome that challenge. I mean, and entrepreneurs have to be optimists. I, I, I'm absolutely, absolutely with you. Um, David, you said uh, expansions don't die of old age, maybe of complacency. Um, well, first, I think I, I'd say one. One quick word to the drugs. I, I agree, everybody continue to be innovative. I don't want to change that at all. Uh, but at least in the US, we all complain, and you'll know the right, rightfully wrongfully, that our drug prices are far too high, and it's largely the fault of our government, they ought to do something, like push them down. So, and there are a lot of us who probably buy a lot of pharmaceuticals. So maybe the government will do something positive from my point of view, I'm not sure it'll be positive from the pharmaceutical industry. But I, I, in thinking about the question of disruption and what, what might you know, turn up that was unexpected, and thinking back over the last few years in economics, uh, we, came out of, we survived the financial crisis. You know, this was no fun. But we came out, and I think a lot of people are saying, we did the right thing. We did a whole lot better than the previous generation had done in the 1930s. Uh, all the numbers say we were much, much better off than they were. And this is fantastic, and we just keep sailing on into the future. And uh, maybe the only good thing Mr. Trump has done is he's shaken a whole lot of us up about this. And his election, at least in the United States, and at least for what people might call the elite, which I would say is a lot of the people in this room, whether you're from the US or not, it, it was a bit of a shock, at least for those of us in the United States. Um, and that case, that disruption was good. Uh, another economist who some of us all learned about during the middle of the financial crisis, 
uh, was an uh, American economist named Hyman Minsky. And he argued that economies go through a crisis, and then they go through a period where it generally they resumes growth, and it gets better, and everybody's happy, and all the regulations that were put in place to control a future crisis and prevent it are gradually peeled back, and then we all forget about it. And I think that's the story that... 70s, the 80s, the 90s, into 2007. And that story was beginning to repeat itself. And so maybe Trump disrupted that story now, which is good. And maybe we'll decide it's not so shocking. And that story will repeat itself. And uh, the disruption will come nastier a little bit later on. But either way, it's coming. It's coming. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to open up the panel now to give these five male, almost white, um, <laughs> uh, uh, complacent bunch uh, a heart kick in somewhere. Um, before I do that, let, let us answer the question again that we've, we've, we've put up first. And the question, remember, was how will the global economic situation develop over the next year? And, and I, please join us. I, I really want to have a comparison of the data <laughs> before and after the little discussion that we had on the panel. Can we have the live results up on the screen? And then I'll reveal what my hypothesis was to you. <laughs> I, can, I can reveal my hypothesis first if you want to, but please give us the data. I, I wrote down, um, and that is directed at you, I, for me, I, uh, the sentence here is, you are too smart to believe a panel like that when it comes to the economic outlook. Let's see whether that is true or not. <laughs> there is no poll? Oh, that is a pity. Now you cannot, I mean, you would probably, because of th sympathy with me, you would actually... Re okay, cells are disrupted. Okay. So let's open it up then, and, and you have to disrupt us, please. <laughs> Who is the, where's the first question? We had a lady in the back. Yes, please. Hi. Um, so based on the last... Could you tell you... us who you are and where you yes, come from? Yes, sure. Um, my name is Lena. I'm a graduate student at Georgetown University. Thank you. So out of 94 speakers in these two days, only 15 were women. Now that's not your fault, but you are responsible for the world of finance, banking, and insurance. Can you please explain how in 2017, 5.8% of CEOs are in the S&P 500, and less than 9% of top owners are women, while 44% of employees um, are women, especially considering that Credit Suisse found that companies with more than 10% of women as uh, key leadership positions earn 27% more on credit return on equity compared to those with less than 5%. So, Christoph, there you go. <laughs> I, we, have a, we have a board member of a financial services company here. I mean, the, the CEO <laughs> might also be asked the same question, but maybe you want to go first? Yeah, no, um, I think uh, these numbers reflect the fact that uh, we, have, uh, we are living in a still uh, patriarchalic society, and uh, this has created the situation that there's not uh, a big diversity on leadership levels. And uh, if you want to change this in big corporations, in the end of the day, what is really decisive is a reasonable uh, leadership experience also over time and uh, you cannot just uh, make change happen on executive functions. I'm not talking about board functions in a non-executive role but on executive functions uh, within very few years. So you have to grow up leadership talent, also female leadership talent, but it's not only the female diversity I want to address, there are other dimensions of diversity and uh, that that needs uh, the willingness first of all and then even if you have created this willingness it also needs uh, a time you can accelerate um, uh, particularly on the on the board level because with regard to non-executive board functions leadership uh, uh, experience is not required for every board member which allows also to bring in women for example from academia research uh, uh, other other politic uh, political experience etc so that, that it is easier and there also we see that uh, uh, the 
gender mix is uh, changing faster as it is compared to executive board roles. Why is it so bad in financial services? I mean, I would, I would say it's in, not particularly short, uh, Klaus, you know, guilty as charged. There's no question that the financial services industry has been very slow. When I spent 14 years in investment banking with some of the largest global uh, corporations, Goldman Sachs, Bank of uh, America, Merrill Lynch, uh, and Barclays Capital, and now in a new development uh, bank in uh, China. But in general, it's my observation that you are spot on. The industry as a whole has been incredibly slow to create the culture, the environment, to foster and develop uh, more uh, talent, and to create the, the possibilities to at least, you know, uh, I, mean, I don't even think we, over the next 10 years, when we sit here, we're probably likely to still, the industry might still reflect the sort of current uh, patterns. So something much more drastic is required to um, engineer uh, more, more dramatic change. Yeah, but you will lose a lot of talent, Mario, in the, on the way, right? Why you lose a lot of talent? I mean, the world is changing quickly. We need uh, young people, we need diverse people, we need different people as an industry. Um, a third of the population today in the world is millennials. If you look at uh, how the population of leadership in an organization like ours is, you know, the people have uh, 45 years uh, on average, they're not millennials, right? So we need to give opportunities uh, because uh, this is a changing world and uh, the people who belong to this changing world understand the changing world much better than um, you know, the people uh, like myself who have been born in a different world. So I don't think it's about losing talent. I think it's about the speed of change. Should we are changing, but maybe the speed is not, is not enough. Should, should there be a criterion to include companies in stock market indices based on what they do in that respect? Well, you know, first of all, I think we all, but I would, well, I would plead somewhat guilty to the charge, and I wouldn't argue about that. But I think, I think the place to look is not up here, because I'm guessing most of us have been working for 20, 30, or more years, and so on. Uh, I think the place to look is the distribution, uh, whether it's ethnic, racial, gender, whatever. The place to look is in people coming out of business school, law school, medical school, engineering school, today, the last five years, the next five, 10, 15, and 20 years, and so on. And that, that's really, that's where the, the leaders of tomorrow, to use the word that's used time and time again is, and so on. Um, when I went to engineering school, when I graduated in the class of 1970, which is a long time ago, we had 600 students in the class. There were four women. And this was a university which had a model of I would admit any student for any course. So but they, the, they didn't the, the, quite the, make it. Um, my, I don't know what the number is now, but it's not, uh, you know, it's not 596 and 4. But I'm David, sure the, question, a whole lot better. the question was much more specific. I mean, if the, if the data is correct that uh, the young lady just raised, it would pay off to create an index where female participation in leadership positions um, is actually higher than on average. That would, it's a new there, product well, there, for there you. Are you would, there are two ways it might pay off. Um, the first way, would those companies outperform the market overall? And I don't know the answer. Um, but I'm guessing that the mix of industries would be substantially different than the market overall. I'm guessing it would be tilted heavenly toward technology, and it would be tilted away from finance, as we just suggested, and it would probably be tilted away from oil, gas, coal, and the rest of the energy sector as well. I, I don't, can't go through all the other So sectors. this is a fantastic So I think it would outperform on that basis. So we have the, other, the other question is, if we did it, would be a money-making proposition for us? I don't know, but I think I'll take it back to the office and tell somebody to think about it. So it's a win-win it's situation. I mean, you only, don't only get an economic outlook that you don't believe, because now I have the numbers in front of me. It's the, roughly the same. Still, half of you think it's going to improve, and the other half is split. Oh, there we are. 
um, between getting worse and staying the same. But you also, yes, it's up there, uh, but you also got now uh, free investment advice. It's not that bad. And you got a product idea, so we're, we're improving. <laughs> the, the gentleman in the middle, wait for the microphone, please, and introduce yourself. I'm Jalan from India. I'm delighted that the panel is generally optimistic. But what I'm surprised at, that the countries which are the engines of growth, China, India, Southeast Asia, have barely found mention. I find that uh, Mr. Mestrop has done it, but hardly anyone else. May I have your comments? Yeah, I, I give you a brief comment. It's, it's, uh, growth is something, is, is something which is great, and as entrepreneurs, we all thrive of it. There's no question about it. But lack of growth can be very troubling and, and troublesome. Um, and as we still see it, I, I, I sense that cyclically, and this is why we compose the panel that way, the big impulses for the global economy come from the industrialized nations. That is unfortunately the case. And structurally, we're all with you. I mean, we, we, if this panel had been about the next 20 years of economic growth, uh, the story would have been very different. But you know, if the US economy derails, I'm not that sure that Europe will do well, and neither China nor India. So I did, you know, there is a, this is one world. But the biggest contributions to global growth does come from the emerging markets. So yeah. in, in that sense, absolutely. The, the point is absolutely yeah. spot on. In fact, more than 60% of growth today comes from the developing markets, from Brazil, from, well, not Brazil, take Brazil out, but the, the large uh, emerging markets of India, uh, um, China, Indonesia, etc. I would be even more, extre more extreme. I would say 80% uh, of anything which is good in the economic terms comes from the emerging markets. But the 20% that is bad that comes from the industrialized markets can be very painful for everybody. So that's, I think, why we also, also still need to look at Europe. No, but the consequence is clear that also companies like ours, uh, if we want to grab uh, a growth and we see, for example, uh, growing pricing pressure for our products in many markets of the world, we are focusing on the emerging markets. That's where we have to invest in oh. order to participate at this growth. But there's also a truth of the fact that the absolute numbers uh, uh, are much smaller. So when we look at uh, the absolute numbers of growth, uh, still are more influenced by small growth rates in Europe and the, particularly in the US than of big growth numbers in Latin America or Southeast Asia. But this is changing over time. It's nothing which is relevant for at least our industry in the next five years. But let's say in 10 years' time, I'm quite convinced that for us, the growth rates in China might be as important for the development of the company as the growth rates we uh, uh, are looking uh, carefully in, in the United States. Wonderful. Do we have further questions that would be... Um, you're always in the middle. It's really bad for the microphone people. <laughs> could we have this gentleman here in the middle? It's late in the evening, but you could move faster, I think. <laughs> Good evening. I'm Adil uh, from India. Uh, like Jalan sir, I'm also delighted that uh, you painted India in a very positive picture. And overall, the panel also has a very positive outlook. Uh, I would just like to... Uh, like your input on this thing. Uh, if you look at the next five years, uh, from whatever you have said, uh, I found that uh, there are some things which were missing in your comments because you did not include the volatilities which might come from the loss of jobs, which might uh, come from the uh, wave of automation, which might hit uh, emerging markets like India, many other volatilities. Uh, for example, terrorism, climate change, other things. So if you factor all these things in, uh, then would you change your comment? Leslie, I think, will you have a shot at it? Uh, so I'll, I'll kick off. Um, I would say, firstly, you are spot on. That there are a whole range of variables that might impact and create sources of, of instability. And I find that conversation to be much more uh, interesting because you know, it will be very sad if you know, a year, two years from now, we have a massive black swan event and a major crisis and you all reflect back to this panel and we were all giving more or less the same answers about the outlook to, to the world economy. I agree with you that what we should be looking at, what are the potential sources of real instability and potential uh, variables that could disrupt this uh, story of equilibrium that has been uh, painted. 
Um, there's obviously a lot of structural change happening in a place like India, like uh, China, because these economies are still industrializing. There's massive urbanization. There's obviously large populations in these countries. Uh, there's massive urbanization. And as you correctly pointed out, many people are being displaced from one industry, so the governments need sophisticated uh, planning in place in order to retrain workers who uh, you know, become obsolete in one sector into another sector and so on. I think overall, though, uh, policymakers have become a lot more sophisticated in, in the way in, in, uh, that was done. I'll give you one example of uh, China. Uh, as a result of the massive decline in Chinese growth, as you know, China is now growing at the same levels it grew in 1991, which is 25, 26 years ago. Um, the, in the heavy industries, a few million people have lost their jobs in coal, in, in aluminium, in steel, and so on. Uh, but those, uh, you know, a couple of million people are not sort of, you know, on the streets uh, in China. Uh, many of them obviously have been uh, transitioned, and it's a painful uh, process. But there's a lot more planning uh, and systems and processes uh, around that. It is not just you know, a traditional market economy where people are just sort of you know, left out there to their own uh, devices to, to rely on market mechanisms. Because in a place like China, they cannot afford social instability. It is very important to maintain uh, social cohesion uh, in the society. Um, and, and in India also, I sense, and I travel to India a fair bit, one of our, our key countries that we, that we uh, invest in. Similarly, there's a huge focus on the new sources of potential employment uh, creation where those workers could be absorbed in. So you're optimistic there as well? What I'm suggesting to you is that uh, the instability might not come from uh, those areas. I still believe that the fundamental causes of the global financial crisis of 2008 uh, starting with high levels of borrowing and leverage in the economy, uh, excessive financialization, where the banking sector just becomes so big, too big to fail and too big to jail, as they say. Um, the excessive build-up, the excessive build-up in entitlements where governments do not have, they've got these massive liabilities in terms of health care, uh, pension benefits, etc. And we're just passing on to future generations these uh, challenges. Some of these issues have not been uh, dealt with, and that for me, uh, so, so we, I guess what I'm cautioning is that we should not have this, uh, beneath this calm and this veneer of stability, the issues that arose uh, that led to the 2008 major um, uh, um, you know, eruption in the world economy, those issues have not been solved completely. The, the, um, uh, the situation today is that three of the uh, four biggest uh, economies in the world are in Asia. These are China, uh, Japan, and India. Um, so the economic wave has moved already to Asia, and that will continue in the next year. The only real uh, significant risk that I see for that is social stability. Oh. Because when growth will slow down, and when uh, the Western, as the US now is threatening, starts to defend itself with uh, any form of protectionism, that will uh, create more imbalances in these uh, growing economies. And then social stability is the issue. But again, it's a political issue much more than an economical issue. The trend they have, the track they have taken, is such that over the next years, they will keep on growing much faster than the Western economies. Do we have other questions? Can we? Yes, please. Another one in the middle. Now let's check on the time. <laughs> Now it's faster. Yeah, it's faster now. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. My name is uh, Pandu from Indonesia. Uh, we discussed about um, emerging um, countries uh, like China, India, and in Southeast Asia. But I want to also highlight that uh, many reports uh, inform that over the next 10 years, more than 600 cities um, will account for 65% six, of uh, world uh, GDP. So this is the basic premise that uh, Parak Hana in his book uh, uh, underlines that we need to focus on mega cities rather than um, countries. And I think I believe that uh, one, China's One Belt, One Road initiative will also create that mega city. So do you buy uh, this idea that we need to also enhance, uh, focus more on mega, uh, mega cities and enhance the uh, infrastructure connectivities between these um, cities? Thank you. That's almost a development question. How do you take that? I mean, the, David, probably you have been growing up with, a, with the idea that the economy is a nation state. And now we're questioning that, right? Well, and one, I, I think there's a lot 
a lot to it. And in fact, I think we've heard some, some hints. And that is that companies, which are very much involved in, in growth in, around the world, companies tend to be associated with nationalities. You know, Swiss pharmaceuticals is an example. But one thing we've seen doing indices that companies really, it's very difficult to put a, co a company in a particular country or know where it should be put. Uh, I think what brought it home to me was over the last seven or eight years, a lot of U.S. companies suddenly decided they'd rather be taxed under, in some cases, Swiss law, some cases, U.K. law. So they call up their attorneys and say, change our incorporation. They didn't change the company. Their headquarters didn't move. Their factories didn't move. Their stock market didn't move. It's just a bunch of lines and details in their paperwork changed and so on. And that really says to me that companies you know, that look for growth and seek growth will go to the spot where they find it. And one place they'll probably find it is in, in these large cities. Uh, they obviously attract people. They attract entrepreneurs. They attract innovation. Um, they attract finance to support the innovation, to create entrepreneurs and more companies. And I think we see that. Do we and we, we best stop identifying where economic growth happens with a particular company that's on the incorporation papers do and look to where they're investing and where they're putting their people. David, uh, David. There are a lot of US companies going, putting their people in India because there's a lot of growth. David, do, do we have the right statistics to deal with that trend? I mean, we, we, we have national statistics usually. We look at national stuff, right? <laughs> And now we, we see an economy which is fragmentizing into regions and cities. And do we have the right data to keep track of economic development? We, the, the problem is it's not just the way we think about companies, but the way we do a lot of things is still go back to the national governments, you know, where, we get the, where we get the support, where we get the aid for when there's disruption, where we arrange for unemployment benefits, all these things more and more just go back to the national government. And that, that may not be the best place for them to go. Um, and yeah, it's going to be difficult to deal with that. Um, we have you know, national... I, I live in a big city in the United States, and all the people in New York think we're getting cheated while the money goes to the rest of the country. Um, if you ask me, I'll say it's absolutely true, but I don't have the numbers. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Awesome. I agree fully with your statement. Cities are becoming the most important economic actors. I'll give you an example. Uh, multilateral development banks, including the New Development Bank, for example, our biggest clients will be cities because it will be cities that design urban transport uh, uh, systems uh, because, I mean, as you might know, uh, something like 60% of the world population by as early as 2030 will be living in uh, cities. So these are uh, mayors will become much more important than national ministers of state. So there's this inevitable drive towards uh, giving a formal expression to that uh, important role that uh, cities will uh, play. Wonderful. Can we have two further questions? And I think then we can wrap it up. So we have one gentleman in the front. and. Way back there, I think there is a lady, if I see this correctly. I hope I don't get the gender issue wrong. Um, and we have the gentleman first. I, that's not very polite, but that's politically correct. So thank you for the opportunity to ask this question. My name is Isha Lua Kintende. I'm a Nigerian, but I live, study, and work in Canada. Uh, it's interesting that um, a conversation about the future of the world economy would uh, take place and almost be concluded without um, a detailed you know, analysis of the role of the African continent um, in, that, in that growth and in that future. Um, so I would not let that pass. So I'll put the question to the, to the panel. And I would ask you that, what do you think the role of Africa is? And we almost cannot say that Africa does not have a role in this emerging economy and in this growth. Um, African countries over the next two decades would um, um, comprise of the world's population, the largest portion of the world's population, and it's seen as the next frontier for economic development. So what, in your opinion, is the role of Africa in this emerging economic discourse? Thank, Thank you. you very much. That was the first question, and the lady in the back. Uh, hello, my name is Katharina Hecht. I'm from the London School of Economics. Uh, my question actually 
uh, follows on from the previous question, and it's about economic inequality. Uh, we talked about a lot. We talked a lot about economic growth, um, but not about how it is shared within the country or globally. So I was wondering how your view is on that issue, because I think a lot about the issues that we've discussed, populism in Europe, the election of Trump, I think is related to the fact that growth hasn't been shared equally in many countries. Thank you. Thank you very much. I want all of you to answer these questions, but very quickly, if that is possible. <laughs> sure. I Leslie, that. I mean, if you're, I have to start with uh, you because of Africa. Again, you are uh, spot on. Uh, I'll, I'll do the second question uh, first. The, uh, when you look at the economic discourse and the, and the language, just look at the, go to the G20 website. G20 is obviously the most important global forum. It's no longer the G7 because it includes all the major systemically important global uh, economies. You will see that all the ministers of finance, when you look at their, their commentary, and this is all online, you can look at the most recent G20 discussion that took place in Hangzhou in China. They talk about uh, economic growth through the lenses of inclusive growth, sustainable growth, balanced growth. There's a huge focus on dealing with the problem of inequality. And it's not a recent discussion. This has been going on since the financial uh, crisis, ever since the G20 became the, the, uh, a forum of heads of state of the, of the 20 biggest uh, economies. The code has not been cracked yet. I mean, as you know, Piketty has really demonstrated through his uh, book, uh, Capital in the 21st Century, demonstrated that there seemed to be a direct correlation between, or there seemed to be a, a clear correlation between uh, economic growth and, and uh, the development of capitalism, and at the same time, uh, concentration of, of wealth and therefore patterns of, of inequality. How exactly, which policy interventions we should use, uh, why monetary and fiscal policy have sort of failed us, quantitative easing and so on, I think many of the policymakers are still grappling with that question, the, with the how. But in summary, you are spot on distributional issues. Uh, is at the center of economic policy uh, t today, because inequality will be the, 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 the source of probably the next major um, uh, eruption. With respect to Africa, uh, I cannot agree with you more. African economies are obviously a lot more underdeveloped. The one issue you touched on is demographics. Demographics, as you know, it's not destiny, but it is very, very important. Africa, as you might know, over the next 20 years will not just have the biggest population, but it will produce the biggest workforce, about 1.3 billion, 1.2 billion people in 2050. Uh, uh, that, that's the size of the labor force that Africa will contribute to, to, to the world, because it's got the youngest population and also the highest population growth. But the economies in Africa are still very, very underdeveloped. I'll give you one statistic which is really worrying, and I'll end off with that. The entire total installed power capacity in sub-Saharan Africa Right, it's about the same as Spain, uh, Spain's installed uh, capacity. It just shows you how big the power deficit is. An economy cannot grow unless you have uh, power, unless you can power your factories, power industries. So there's a massive gap, a structural gap that Africa still still has. But it has a very very important role to play uh, in the development over the next couple of decades. Thank you. Thank you, Leslie. I didn't really understand whether you. Were I don't think you've answered the questions, but I, maybe Mario could do this. And maybe more particular, in, in your international strategy, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, Africa doesn't figure as a top priority. Why is that? Uh, because you can literally be everywhere. And so we had to make choices. Uh, on Africa, I, I have two concerns. Uh, first of all, um, you know, if we learn from Asia and how Asia became so prominent today, uh, it is because states did uh, take a lot of actions and did take control of economic development. Africa often has still weak states, and uh, that could be an obstacle to catch up quickly on this growth. Uh, and, uh, and that is something that uh, over time will be resolved, but the sooner is the better. The second thing is that Asia also came out of a period of uh, unprecedented uh, peace in Asia. Uh, and that also was equally important. Um, Africa, unfortunately, still has too many um, acts of wars in South Africa, and that's not beneficial. Uh, peace does much better for growth than wars. And inequality? Yeah. On inequality, I think, I think we're heading towards uh, some structural rethinking of the role of state, of what subsidies are, because uh, matching up uh, globalization with technology, it really makes, uh, uh, you know, some people, in, in, especially in the Western universe, but not necessarily uh, there all only, uh, worse off than before. 
It's very difficult to find market solutions for this, and I think progressively what we will see um, is that democracy will shift toward the different balance um, of subsidies and state aids and state role for that. I don't think the market can cope with this without the rethinking of the role of states. So the government will actually do something I or have so. to do something about it. Yes. And it, it, rich and poor, that is also a dimension which is important for Roche. I mean, your, your, your drugs are, I mean, they come at a price. And there is a question of equality or equal opportunity to having access to your drugs. That is a major subject in your strategy, I know. Yeah, obviously we cannot make a choice in the sense as maybe the insurance industry because we feel that all patients who need our medicines mm -hmm. should have access uh, to these medicines independent of geography or uh, uh, purchasing power. Um, still, uh, we, it is not uh, something, we, an issue which we can solve on our own. We have learned that we can move things, but it's only possible with partnerships. And these partnerships are partnerships uh, with uh, sometimes other pharmaceutical companies, sometimes with patient organizations, with non-government organizations. But most important, I think it's partnerships with governments. We have to remind governments, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa, of their responsibility towards their population. And uh, today it doesn't matter to give away our highly sophisticated medicines for free. Uh, the problem is that, for example, for cancer, there is uh, not one single trained cl clinical oncologist in Nigeria, a country of 180 million people, because the last one uh, went back to the United States. How do you want to have treatment, performing treatment, if there is no diagnostics? How do you want, you know, the, I tell you a, a story from, from, from Ivory Coast where, you know, they, they got a, a ra radiation machine for, for radiotherapy for free. Yeah? And uh, unfortunately, 40% import taxes. Yeah, this machine was sent to a different country where you didn't have the import taxes. Still, there doesn't exist one single machine in the country. As long as we have these basic deficiency of infrastructure, uh, uh, so you're, then you're not optimistic. We, uh, yeah. we, no, we, we will see a development, but it is slow, and the, what we are doing is not, uh, okay, we distribute our drugs, fair enough, and there is then also a private system, and in all these countries, there is a very tiny part of the population who can for, afford to pay uh, any medicine out of pocket, or uh, they, they have the means to, to hop on the next aircraft and go to uh, a hospital here in Europe. But uh, uh, in the end of the day, it is important for us to, to develop a, a sustainable infrastructure uh, in these countries. This is true for me medicine, but it is also true for energy, as we have heard. It is true for uh, road transportation, for rail transportation. Here, how do we deal with public transport in uh, 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 big urban uh, agglomerations? Uh, uh, there is a lot of uh, challenges ahead. Um, which are uh, at this moment difficult to master if we have population growth rates which are below, beyond 2% a year. David, I don't want to bother you with Africa. Again, we had two views here, but your country is, is actually is absolutely fascinating when it comes to the issue of inequality. Um, there is this, you had this presidential election. Many people say one of the reasons why Trump was voted into office was related to the fact that so many people felt left out of the economic development. And, 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 but still, they, they elect somebody who is apparently a billionaire. I'm not sure whether that is true or not <laughs> since this morning. I'm, I don't believe anything I hear about him anymore. So he's a billionaire and he promises tax cuts to his billionaire friends. How does that, I mean, so inequality, is that an issue in the US really? Or are you just ignorant, I, blind? I don't know. What, how is that going to change? What is your expectations four years from now, three years from now, three and a half years from now? Will the U.S. Uh, income scale be more unequal, or? Um, well, I, I would agree. An inequality is a, is a very big issue in the United States, and I suspect it's a very big issue in, in most countries. Uh, unfortunately, I don't think it's going to change very much between now and four years from now in the United States. Um, but you have a tax reform coming up with tax rates being cut. Well, Trump's tax reform as written is about the way you described it. It makes the rich richer and it makes the poor poorer. And it shifts some of the, 
some of the uh, distribution around the states, um, the simple way is to say that if your state voted for the Democrats, it's probably not going to come out ahead in the tax reform program. Uh, California, New York at the top of that list, uh, as happens, but we won't go into all the details about that. The, the, the big difficulty in doing something about inequality, uh, well, I think the first thing, if, if you look back, and I can't remember the, where the citation to the book, <coughs> but what I read in a series of reviews, if you look back over history and you ask, what kind of events brought down the inequality in the income distribution, what really changed the distribution of income in some countries, and it was having a war. Um, that's not the way to fix it. I, I don't want to do that for sure. A, a stock so market crash could help. Real estate, what? A stock market crash could help. Um, real estate bubble burst help. I mean, there's a lot of things that can happen. We, we, we talked about too much debt. We just wipe out all that debt, and many people will lose their assets. So we have much more equal society. <laughs> you know, the problem is, for everybody who borrowed money, there's some, in this case, poor character who loaned it to them. There so, you go. It, I don't know if it all comes out the right, right place. I think the big challenge is to start doing something, but find a program that's not going to take 50 years to get any place, because it, ain't gonna, it won't satisfy anybody. Um, and I don't have an easy answer. I think part of it is, part of it is definitely tax reform. Um, and, um, you know, let's make it a little bit simpler so at least somebody has a hope of understanding why he's paying taxes or so on, because most of us don't. But I think that's part of it. And there are a lot of other steps, jobs, education, so on. Unfortunately, those don't solve things overnight. So, um, but if we get started, maybe we'll give everybody a little hope we're going in the right direction. And that buys us a little time. Not 50 years, but a little bit. Um, Thank you. But I don't have a solution to promise. That's the dismal part of economics. Thank you. Let me do three things ending this panel. One is an observation, uh, or two observations, actually. Um, we were reasonably optimistic, uh, and many people share that view. Um, in fact, when you look at consumer sentiment surveys around the globe, so this is when you ask people, how do you do? This is not about the economy, it's about your individual, personal, financial situation, your outlook, your job prospects. The numbers we get at the moment are phenomenal. Uh, even in the United States, where some people say there were so many people who were left behind, um, the, 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 the consumer survey we have there is just exceptional. Uh, we do this since 1951, uh, and if you take all of these uh, uh, in the last 50 years, I think, on a monthly basis, all of these surveys, only in 8% of the times did the respondents, so the households in the US, say things were better than they are now. This is absolutely amazing observation. We see the same in Europe, we see the same in China, even where we have this data. So people do believe um, they have a good life. Still, we have this populist issue, something that gives me a lot of, uh, of, of, of sleepless nights and things to think about. The second observation is uh, something I have when I'm uh, allowed to speak or moderate at investors conferences. There you always also have these surveys. And a typical question at an investors conference is, at the beginning of the year, so which asset class, which type of investment is going to do best this year or next year or whatever? And I bet you the one with most votes is usually the worst. <laughs> You can do your same math, uh, your, your math on your own about the survey we had. Um, I'm, I, as I said before, I have this déjà vu. Everybody thinks everything is great, and, and usually these things don't turn out that way. Maybe this is because I'm an economist and, and I, I constantly see the world, you know, falling apart. That's part of the trade. Um, but maybe that is something that we should also try to think about. Two other things. We're, I want to thank the panelists very much. Um, for participating. It was a tough job. Um, you did a wonderful job in giving us a very, very well balanced um, view of what's going on and where your companies are and what your individual perspectives are. And the last thing I want to do um, is I want to ask you to give these guys a hand, but don't leave the room. Because after this, 
Priscilla will invite us um, to actually a very special treat, a very special opportunity to pay a little bit of gratitude for the last couple of days that we had. Thank you very much and thank you, gentlemen. <laughs>